They would be in this area. Do you remember, remember what this was called? Well, this is what country is this today? What do they on that map of the ancient world? What did I call this? Yeah, that's Asia Minor. Uh -huh. I didn't call it that. That's it was me. I did it. It was all me. I came up with that. Asia Minor. This is coming out of your paycheck. Yeah, you're gonna be like 50 years old and I'll still be docking your paycheck because of that. <laughs> and when you get 50, I probably won't figure it out. Moving on. So they, much of the, the roots of this are these Indo-Europeans, that's a, a generic name, Indo-Europeans, people live in this area here. Horsemen are constantly bumping and running into each other, and they were pushed into here. And from the steppes of what is now Russia and Ukraine, Kazakhstan, you know, right here. The Ukraine? The Ukraine, yes. I'm trying, I'm trying very hard to not say the Ukraine and say Ukraine. It's a bad habit for people my age. I'm not alone in saying the Ukraine. By the way, speaking of the Ukraine, did you see that uh, Russia has mobilized all the reserves, meaning that they are desperate and losing? That is like, and he's, Putin's obviously worried about someone even more radical and fascistic than, than him. So is that the Ukraine on the offensive Yeah. The Ukraine, yeah. yeah the Ukraine, <laughs> Ukraine is, yes. So they keep sweeping him, and... Eventually would settle. We're talking you know, they come in like a wave, push groups out of the way, or kind of join in, intermarry, or just take. And yes, capture and capture slaves. But don't forget slaves, not it's just slaves be relatively tempor not temporary, different. And this blending of culture. And blending of the style of organized government, there's a group there called the Lydians. And it would be the Lydians that were the first one to capture gold, which would spread. We've already talked about the importance of gold and money. And so the Hittites would be known for their ability, not only using gold coins, but their ability of using molds to shape gold coins, put some kind of royal Hittite stamp on it to show it's legitimate. And so the gold coins, so therefore, the value of it was stored in the coin, and that's called a, called specie. Now, of course, the problem with that is, what do you do if the value is stored in the coin? They would start shaving it, and the coins would shrink. That's why you see older coins, sometimes they get very thin. That's why they're shaving it off to try to make more coins. And, yes. It's not like a coin. Exactly. Have you ever seen a quarter? They have the little ridges on it. That is a legacy of old specie, gold or silver coins. They put that little ridge on there so you couldn't shave it. That's exactly why. Because if you shaved it, you get rid of those little ridges. And so they just kind of kept that as kind of a tradition. Your quarters themselves have no, no value except for we say it's a quarter. And also they're the first ones, the iron had been used, but the first ones were large production of iron. Iron is a lot stronger. It is sturdier. They can make more weapons out of it. You can make more tools out of it. Pots, you name it, uh, for fortifications. But the big thing, of course, is going to be for weapons and for um, strong parts on ships. That would be really key, having iron pieces on there. You know, little things like that. And from iron, once you know how to make that, if you increase the heat, get more imperfections out, usually add something like nickel into it, and they just would kind of experiment. It would only be a, a, a couple hundred years later that you would have steel, which is even stronger, does not rust, a lot harder to make, but wow, could it be useful? And so with that, it's no coincidence that the Hittites would master chariots because they could make stronger wheels. That, you know, think about an arrow with an iron tip that would go right through the the uh, other phalanxes of uh, leather shields change everything. Or iron, yeah, an iron sword is going to be heavy. If anyone's ever picked up an iron sword, but an iron sword, and you're fighting somebody with a bronze sword, 
and iron will just chop it up. Yeah, basically you kind of rip it out, rip it out of the hand. And just, so yeah, these guys are going to be pretty amazing. And so here are Hittite, Hittite phalans and Hittite charioteers. Give them a huge advantage. And they try to keep it secret, but you imagine what's going to happen. Other people will figure out the iron. Speaking of iron, let's get people weapons. It always gets out. The weapons always get out. And we'll really see that by the time we get to like World War I. You know, Germany shoots gas first, just a few weeks later, the Allies are used. So you know, just things like that. And here's Hittite Empire. And I put this map up here because soon after the Hittites, the Assyrians would take all this. And then the county end is the uh, Babylonian Empire. So we have just kind of basically they're all fighting over this for an crescent. And so with that, so the Iron Age, you could say we are right at the Bronze Age, the Iron Age. And I did this flashing thing in to annoy you. It will come in. I accidentally did that when I was just putting in the, you know, just hitting the little button to have them come. Um, to appear, and I left them in because I don't like this either. Bronze Age, Iron Age. Here are iron weapons, iron tools, iron shield. Iron shield has been so heavy. But you put iron in key areas here. Iron, a little bit of, basically the iron part of the helmet here, maybe around here. Be very hard for bronze and wood would have no chance. See, is that annoying? Could have made it spin. So I remember when PowerPoint first came out, and that's what people would do. I was like, just because you can do it, that's something you should do it. I, I, you do it. You have to have it spin. Who was that tool? Did you know? <laughs> <laughs> And so with that, so in Asia Minor, there's a lot more iron. So the iron, you know, there's going to be an incentive. And then, but then on, so much of what's going to happen is trying to get iron mines. So much of what the Romans did, like the Romans are going to fight pretty devastating battles for what we call Romania, yes, after Rome, for iron. Well, what's the thing besides here? Oh, that one. And then smelting iron, which I'll show you how, it, how they did later, but the smelting of iron, superheat it, and then pump oxygen in. And that, that's the beginnings of what we call a blast furnace. And so you'll see this right here. This is a basic element of it. They would take this. They would make it out of stone, and then they would put ceramics on the inside to make it shiny, but also take high heat, and therefore radiate the heat inside. So they could superheat this and burn, and they find coal or something else. Coal would really help too. So it could burn a very long time. It could superheat, but radiate off the sides of the furnace, so it gets even hotter. And so they could go up to a thousand degrees. And the big thing is, to get it super hot, you add oxygen, increase the flame. And so you would get a kind of pump air in. Well, here, Hittite craftsmen, and they're blowing, they have these little straws, and they're like in there. I was thinking about if they sucked in and got the fire, but you know, that's the price you pay for, for iron. And they too collapse under their own weight, constantly fighting wars. And then they too had the invaders, the high scoots come in, swept away the Hittites. And so the Bronze Age, Iron Age, or that would collapse. And then out of the roots of that, out of those ashes would come the Phoenicians. And the Phoenicians lived along this coast. Not a lot of rain, rugged, some very good soil, but they do irrigation, limited crops. 
so they could farm some things, but that encouraged them to trade. And that comes to a very important economic concept. Now let's backtrack. Do you remember what economics? All right, so if we're not sure, everybody write down economics. And I'm going to tell you a good, it's a vocab term. Now people think economics, they think, might think money or business. No, economics are how people deal with scarce resources. People deal with scarce resources. And the people could be individuals, it could be uh, groups of people, villages, or it could be an entire country or society. And what do we mean by scarce resources? We're talking about food, we're talking about shelter, clothing, you know, the base resources, all the way up to things, big chocolate milk. And how, how do we deal with scarce chocolate milk? We spill it on our neighbor's back. You're gonna get me something out of that. Yeah, it's pretty bad. Is it? Yeah. <laughs> But here, let me get some water. <laughs> water. And so, with that, that's how to deal with scarce event, scarce resources. The problem is, there are some areas are good for growing certain kind of crop, or they have certain type of ores they can mine, whatever it might be. And some things they can't do. Other areas they have those. I mean, think about food. What can we grow in Helena? I mean, Green. oranges. Lime, water, pumpkins. There are certain things, Helen. Okay, what do we have? No, no Montana is pretty good for growing wheat. There's some places you can grow maize. There are some minerals here that they dug out and took and left ruined. But comparative advantage means this you do things that you're good at in your area where you have an advantage. And you trade those with other areas for the things they do well. So the Phoenicians were short of some goods, but they could trade others. The comparative advantage. So, for if you go to a grocery store today, this always, it's still, I'm not gonna lie to you, it always will amaze me. Because when I was a kid, I remember when you had grocery stores, this was the United States. And it would be in summer and strawberries or grapes. And you have that time you can get grapes. And it was a relatively short a couple of months you get grapes. Because you can't grow grapes in most parts of the United States, except for you pick know, them a few months of the year. Same with strawberries. We'll think about comparative advantage. Now we get grapes in the summer from parts of the United States. And then we trade things we have here give money to areas that can grow grapes or strawberries year-round. And that is why if you go to the store today, virtually every grocery store, there are grapes year-round. They're shipped from Mexico areas with warmer climates where they can grow them in the summer. And that is a relatively new thing, and that's an example of comparative advantage. Same thing here. We don't grow avocados here. Even by avocados year round, we buy from somebody with a fair advantage and we sell what we're good at. We, as, a, as an entity, as a people. So, what do they have? By 1100 BC, they had these kind of products. One of the biggies that they have and would soon spread throughout the Mediterranean world was from the Murex snail. This snail. When they would, okay, let's be very clear about it. It's not like they would grow the snails and then they'd squeeze a little dog. No, they'd squeeze out the body and be this, this kind of yellowish sludge, but as soon as it's exposed to air, it turned purple. And then they would put a bunch of snail bodies into this pot and mush it up and thus purple dye. And it would be kind of bluish purple, so this really pretty dark purple. And that became cherished. Everybody had to get purple. And if you had wealth, that means the more things you wore in purple, or the more cap, cap, sorry, 
tapestry again, hang it from your walls in purple. So you can imagine how purple would soon become the color of royalty. And that's why to this day, so when they do the coronation of, of King Charles III in Britain, and for whatever reason, Americans are interested in that, they find that so weird. We fought against the king, remember? But to be purple, his gown was in purple. So that legacy survived. Yes. Did they look any other dyes or was it just purple? Now they actually would come up with other dyes that had a yellow and a red, but the purple was so rare. Because look, I mean, it's required 60,000 snails. 60,000 snails. For one. Did I say snails? Snails. Snails. But you see some of that right here. This is from a Roman mosaic in a place called Pompeii. So Pompeii, we'll talk about Pompeii later, but this was a town that was destroyed by Mount Vesuvius and covered with, with ash, so much of it was they get by almost intact from the moment that the volcano erupted, Mount Vesuvius near Naples. And purple, purple, boss with purple on it. Wow. And with that, of course, you could haul other things in. It. And they were good at glass blowing, speaking of things. Yeah, that's kind of part of the reason. And that everybody claimed it. You know, so let's not do it. <laughs> so these they um how do you get glass? Sand. Yeah, superheat sand in the same kind of furnace that they made iron out of. You heat glass and glass would become the craze for a while. Glass making would start to go under, but you see a big research of glass making about the 1400s. And then by 1600s, they cut down all the trees in Britain for glass. So what else do they have? The, the Phoenician took their alphabet and think about cuneiform. They had cuneiform, but it was so complex. All those little characters. Has anyone tried to learn in like a lot of characters? Has anyone try to learn like Korean or Chinese or Japanese? this wow they had just had so many things to remember the great advantages and the phoenicians would be one of the first to discover this instead of having a symbol for all the different sounds and letters each individual symbols they came up with 23 symbols and then they would put those symbols together to label everything from snails to codes to you have a language what a great advantage because that's where the alphabet comes from and so, Canaanite, which is now present to Israel, you see some of their kind of pictographs eventually coming to Phoenicians, and you see that mold right into Greek. And then when Latins in, uh, the Latins in what is now Italy would take the Greek and turn into Latin letters, which are the letters that we use in this class today. Yeah. Did they add the... Uh... The rest of the oh see the rest of them that just compares with the phoenicians but you start seeing that there's more letters in greek uh, and so they're going to come 800 bc and here okay by 300 ad our alphabets there that's why so if you go see words in latin and roman ruins you can see the letters and make them out okay. latin would die as a language but the letters remain and so there are some of the Phoenician letters. And so the Phoenicians are right here on the coast. And what they did is through their trade, as they traded along here, they spread the language here, here, here. Just spread everywhere. It's amazing how fast trade would spread things. Products, language, math, you name it. So one of the most famous civilizations that would come out of this would be this amalgamation of Greek civilization and Phoenician, uh, Phoenician civilization on Crete, right here. So the Minoans would create this civilization. You see it tied in with Greek, it disappeared. We don't know if it was a volcano, if it was invaders, if we got bored, but the Phoenician thing would spread throughout Europe 
colonizing or kind of mixing, but then colonizing all the way into what is now Spain. All the way. Major colonies right here. The largest would be in Carthage, but they also colonized right next to Greek colonizers in a place right here called Ionia. So you see a real blending of cultures. So when we get to Greece, we're going to talk about something you know, kind of briefly, but you might have heard of the Trojan War and the Trojan Wars. That was a combination of Greek and Phoenician civilization. And so with that, they also developed great, if you're, if you're sailing, you have to develop navigational tools. Now the big thing about navigation, they did have sailing vessels and most of them would also be galleys, so they would be rowed. Here's one of the Phoenician charts. And a lot of this would be developed in Ionia. Oh, I thought I typed that in. Uh, I thought I typed it in, but it would write that they would use geometry to navigate. And I'll show you exactly when we get to the Greeks, because the Greeks would perfect this. Here is Pythagorean theorem. We're coming to that. And they would use that. Now, that only had limited effect. They used geometry to, to navigate and get a, a, a pretty good estimate about distances. Their problem was this. They needed land. If they did not have land, they were in real trouble. And so most of the navigation would have to be kind of bouncing along the coast. I think that's all. And so, oh, and that's the trireme. They would eventually develop at first one, eventually three rows of oars. Oh, we will come back to these boats. And these triremes or something like it, developed by the Phoenicians, would be used all the way up to the 17th century in the Mediterranean. You could use it as the Mediterranean because, yes, they'd have storms, but it was relatively calm. They had relatively flat bottoms. They could skim across the water. Waves would just rock it just all over the place. The North Atlantic would be a difficult place for one of these. Mediterranean, you could do it. Yeah, and you had to be very coordinated on the rowing. And it was it was not slaves. They were free people. It was kind of a job. It was, it was, um, they would get part of the pay. But also, we have a bunch of row or oars. It takes up room. You can haul goods. That's why when they developed better sailing vessels, it made a big deal. We will make these on Canyon Ferry and Ram. I think we can catch jet skiers. Yeah. <laughs> And that is a sail with purple dye from a Phoenician boat. Where did they find it? That one? That was found in present day Lebanon. And so, Greek, here's Egypt, but spreading out. Yes, there'll be a big battle. The biggest city would be of the Phoenician cities would be Carthage, and we're coming to a major battle with the Romans. Speaking of that, a little bit further south. In, Can in Cana and Judea, Judea, Judea yeah. sorry, I can't speak all of a sudden. Another group would form that would be a couple times independent kingdoms, but would have a lasting impact on history would be the Hebrews. Once again, another tribe. We have limited knowledge about exactly where they came from. We have an idea where we have people here and then people immigrated from Ur and probably started establishing what is now in present day Israel what we call today Jordan, created right after World War I, Lebanon and Syria. And so that's in Canada. And out of the Hebrews would become a monotheistic religion called Judaism. And therefore the Hebrews would be called Jews. And they have an Aramaic language. And as they wrote down their years later, writing up the tradition in a language kind of like Phoenician called Aramaic, Aramaic and then, um, also, they would use Babylonian and Latin. Eventually, they would write the Torah. And out of the Torah, that would become the Old Testament of what's going to be called the, um, the Christian Bible, and also the roots of the, the Quran in Islam from the Torah. And so that's why what happened here, relatively small group, but with great and lasting impact down the road. So somewhere, you know, about the same time we have the, the flowering of Egypt, we have probably coming from Ur. Remember, that was that first of those Mesopotamian cities. 
to Kata was, I thought I wrote him in. <laughs> I did. <laughs> After. After. Abraham. And Abraham is considered to be the founding or the founder of the Hebrews. And this also comes from the Torah of the Old Testament. And so the father-like figure, a.k.a. the patriarch. And it is here where he made a covenant with, as he saw it, a new God. A covenant with God. Now, I got to get to the, there's actually, even though it's going to be monotheistic, meaning one God, they actually list two gods in the Torah. It's a little confusing. And basically what happens is Judaism and then Christianity and Islam just said, well, the two gods are the same God. Okay. You know, they're alive. And so they make a, a covenant, which is a contract of their faith to this God. And in it, they would be promised this land. He escaped Ur and made it to here. And this promise to Abraham which is in the Torah, and in the Old Testament of the Christian Bible, would be the justification for years later is uh, the creation of the nation of Israel, 1948. This was promised to us. And this will happen a couple of different times. And so this will also see it called as Palestine. And out of Abraham will come 12 tribes, each for one of his 12 sons, of one of his sons. I'm sorry. One of his sons would be named Jacob. He would have 12 children, and one of those sons would rename himself Israel. And that's the term, the people of Israel, right here. And these were patriarchs, meaning the father. Right here. Jericho is one of the first cities. Jerusalem is going to come later. Right here, present day Israel. So, a couple things really quick then. So it's unclear what happened. Hebrews were there. There was fighting amongst the different, um, different tribes, different small little kingdoms. Some of the Hebrews were either enslaved or they went in debt to Egypt. And so we're not exactly sure what happened. This is a big, there's about three different versions of it. But it says in the the Torah was written about 12, 1050 or 1065 BC. Hebrews either migrated because of climate change. We don't know what happened. Pushed by tribe, a number of different reasons. But probably because of debt, many of them would become slaves. To Ramses II. We've already had Ramses, right? And so there were slaves that built many of Ramses' great monuments. A lot of times when they, this will be referred to, and you see pictures like this one here. They always have a building, one of the pyramids. The pyramids were already built, <laughs> built 2,000 years earlier. So they're building um, Ramsey's great monuments. And these could have been just being in the wrong place at the wrong time. Ramsey's tried to attack the Hittites. He failed, but he needed to show he won. So let's enslave somebody else as spoils of war. We won, and so the Hebrews could have been in the way. We don't know who Moses was. Moses could have been an Egyptian, could have been an Egyptian and Hebrew uh, as part uh, product of intermarriage, but he grew up with the Egyptians, and then he would become, not sure how this happened, but the time with the Hebrews to help lead the Hebrews out of it, and that would be called the Exodus, where Moses would lead the Hebrew slaves out of Egypt. Now, this would turn into a very long 40 year walk and then another 60 years of trying to reestablish Cain. But it would be here that they would lay out, Moses would lay out, as he said, this was given to him by a burning bush from God, let's bring to God in just a second, but the Ten Commandments. And in it, it implied that we have a promised land, now we are the chosen people. Which, by the way, is pretty good advertising. Don't you want to be with us? We're chosen. And they moved back to the fertile presence. 
this is a great saga about uh, parting the Red Sea and all that. I'm going very quickly, obviously. And these are the Ten Commandments. It's not the Code of Hammurabi. It doesn't deal necessarily with all real life issues. So it's a combination of very religious orders about how to obey the religious gods and then certain person-to-person uh, -person transactions. But you'll notice, no other gods before me, no graven image of me, shall not take the Lord's name in vain, me, keep the Sabbath day, keep it holy, me, honor thy father and thy mother. Now, you think, what does that do with God? There's a higher people, isn't there? Top, something on top, obey the higher people. God's on top. And then kill, adultery, shall not steal. We got to control these bunch of crazy Billy or uh, um, crazy mountain people we come into contact with by not lying at your neighbor. And don't be jealous, especially of people with wealth. And so that's when the first five books were written. Just a little bit left to finish tomorrow. Sound good? A little bit left to finish. And then I'll review everything on that review list that you have questions about. And the test is already written. And now, really good news for all of you. You want to hear it? 100%. Yeah, I'm doing really well when the test starts right. I'm doing really well. You have a special mind. Yeah, look. You trust me. So the test is really the first one. Two thousand points. All of it oh, yeah. is uh, nothing we've learned this morning. So. No. Uh, okay. Yeah, I did not see that he right before it. And, uh, and if you get a single one, you build the whole test. And it's tiny and it's well, and it goes to the clock. So you fail math or you fail. Tiny So what I'm going to do is I'm going to sit down on my computer and I'm just going to come up with random things off the top of my head. Just whatever I'm thinking about that time, and that will be the test. Hmm? Now you've told everybody publicly humiliated. So I'm gonna go back to the oh, by the way, so I type the grades in, and when I type it on the computer, you type it in and you press down, you know, it moves out. It takes a, like a half a second for it to come on the screen, which annoys me to no end. I don't have to put the ads up. And so I don't really see what I type in. So I go back and look. And sometimes I miss grades. So if I accidentally miss your score, please let me know and I will humiliate you personally and reduce your grade. So I actually instead of 10 points on the map, I could give you one, right? Which you probably deserve, but I said, no, I went back and I changed it to 10. Please let me know if I make a mistake. I do not mean to. Okay, some of you I do. I'm about to get you, but this may be up. Hmm? Next time I will take it and I'll bounce it down the hall. Does it sound good? I'm skipping some. Have a good day, everybody. Rob, do you have work? Check a lot of Garfield. It's teaching. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I saw you in the hallway. What? And you said you were going to be here. Well, no. Yesterday, I thought I was at a chiropractor appointment. I know. Crazy. 
chiropractor's appointment? Yeah, we get it with the team, so. Huh? We get it with, like, the Jewish guys. Like, I had I know, but you got to be here, you know. Yeah, yeah, yeah. To show you something, and I want yeah. You want my approval? That's yeah. a lot. What? I have this this handy dandy thingy, and I can write on it, write my notes on the thing, like an actual pen. And it's like, well, which you can write on this and cover it up. You know, it's like, here with it. Like, 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 pictures of, like, the. Yeah, it's like, 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 like a can I use it for the class? I can't remember doing this in work. Yeah. Um, I know. I just wanted to. Okay. Yeah. It just seems like a big Thank you. All right, everybody. Our good news followed by more good news. What's that? You just wearing stuff? Yeah. What's on your mind? mind and oh, mushrooms. Is that from Boo? The stage I see on the monkey. Who is this Ross person? <laughs> <laughs> All right, so we're on the Vietnam War. We are two minutes in. Did you go to an assembly for PAP? What? Coming up. Assembly for PAP. August is next week. Forget it. No assembly. Yeah, yeah. PAP. PAP is lots of friends. All right, kids. Paper. I got to print a couple more. I thought I printed enough, but it looks like I did. Oh, I actually did print enough, but I see what I did. I did not spill water. I spilled water on my desk. So I did not spill on these. Good. Who said my name? Yes. So who needs a uh, worksheet from yesterday? We are on question number 14. Is that right? Uh, right, 14? We need one in this row, and we need two in this row. Your shirt is nineteen okay, well, big nineteen seventies and Ross. You believe yourself? No. I got it from Ross. <laughs> <laughs> <Happy. laughs> Are you in your seat ready to learn? No. Thank you. I like the blue towel. All right. So we are on again. Little Egyptian. We're not exactly sure what it is, but it looks vaguely Egyptian. And since we're talking Egypt, and that's what it. That was a gift. Wait, what is that? What is that? <laughs> you paying any attention? <laughs> she's not ready. Don't look at her. That will be. Like, she's not ready. Made up. Yeah. Okay, I was gonna say I, I pronounced that Yahweh. Yeah. Yeah. Yahweh. Yahweh. Am I better? And then slip out for the one. Oh, yeah. oh, yeah. There's two in the Torah of the Old Testament. There's two gods. And then they kind of mold this up. It's just one of the things. All right. So let's go ahead and we're on question number. I think we have. Have we got the question number one yet? No. All right. So this series is very well done. But let me tell you one thing. So. It does it in very generic terms, but it's it's uh, 
It talks about what's going on in the battle, and it talks about a reporter who witnessed a girl who was raped. And doesn't give any real details about it, but they do mention it. And so I'm just uh, learning you of that. And it's it's kind of done in a very well, also shows how they just attempt 